Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I should lay my cards on the table right at the start by saying that I was a very active campaigner for Remain in the EU referendum and therefore, like a lot of my fellow campaigners, rather devastated by the result. But as most of you will know, the Prime Minister Theresa May has said Brexit means Brexit and therefore for most of my talk I will assume that we will indeed leave the European Union. I have to say in parenthesis that it did strike me that Brexit means Brexit was about as helpful a statement as a banana is a banana. The timetable for withdrawal is already reasonably well known. The Prime Minister has said we will, leave, we will uh, invoke Article 50, which is the clause of the Lisbon Treaty which allows a member state to leave the European Union by the end of March 2017. There will then be two years of negotiations with the other 27 member states on the withdrawal mechanisms, which are extremely complicated. And only after that, therefore, at Mar in March 2019, at the earliest, can we expect Britain to be outside the European Union. Now that will be quite a wrench, because of course we have been members for over 40 years, and a huge number of our laws are intimately linked with European legislation and indeed much of our trade, of course, is with other members of the European Union. And in the course of my remarks, I'll look at trade, as well as immigration, students and cultural diplomacy, while of course emphasising the Commonwealth element. Now the Daily Express, for one, amongst the newspapers, has been triumphant about the Brexit vote, arguing that this will mean that Britain can have much stronger links with the Commonwealth and totally recalibrate its trading relationships. Unfortunately, that is based on a rather uneconomic assumption in the sense that the amount of trade Britain has with even significant Commonwealth countries like Australia is considerably less than it has with its near neighbours in Europe, which is partly a reflection of geography, but also a reflection of our 40 year of membership of the European Union. 44% of our trade is with other EU partners, just over 1% is with Australia, and therefore the um, articles that have appeared in the Daily Express and the Daily Mail and others suggesting that it would be easy just to switch um, our trading relations are um, frankly way off the mark. Now it was rather odd during the EU referendum that all Commonwealth citizens legally resident in this country were able to vote but EU citizens, with the exception, of course, of Brits and of Irish citizens, um, were not. Uh, perhaps unfair, given that the EU citizens, of whom there are probably about three million, um, had most to lose by a vote in favour of Brexit. Now, at the moment, our trade, Britain's trade, is governed by European rules. Um, we are, since being a member of the European Union, all our trade negotiations have been within the framework of European negotiations. And Europe, the European Union, is in the process at the moment of trying to finalise um, some often quite difficult trade talks with major partners. You probably have heard of the rather controversial transatlantic TTIP that the EU has been trying to uh, bring to conclusion, not very successfully. But it's also um, been talking for seven years to Canada and we can expect um, trade agreements with many other 
members of the Commonwealth as well through the EU. And in fact, the EU, thanks to Britain's membership, does already have trade relationships and aid relationships with many of the Commonwealth member states, particularly those in Africa. 18 of the Commonwealth member states of 53 are in Africa. And really from the 1970s onwards, thanks to Britain joining what was then the European Economic Community in 1973, um, a special relationship was established with those African former colonies as part of the so-called Lome Convention. It wasn't just the British, former British territories, of course, it was the French, the, the Belgian, and so on, Portuguese. And so quite a complex and generous aid and trade package was worked out under the Lome Convention linking the EU to uh, developing countries in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, but not Asia. Um, the feeling at the time, and I, I covered the Lome Convention negotiations when I worked as a journalist based in Brussels, was that countries such as India and Pakistan were just too big uh, to be able to enter into such an aid and trade arrangement, and therefore separate things had to be negotiated. And many of those Commonwealth countries that have benefited from originally the Lome Convention, which was then replaced by the Yaoundé Convention and more recently by bilateral economic partnerships, have really valued the fact that Britain, within the EU, has in a sense been able to champion the cause of particularly small and vulnerable Commonwealth countries. When Britain leaves the European Union, that will no longer be the case. Even if we have what has been called a soft Brexit rather than a hard Brexit, in other words, remaining part of the single market, though formally leaving the European Union, we will not be present at the regular meetings, not just of ministers, but of officials. So there will no longer be that British voice at the table when discussing the interests of Commonwealth countries, some of whom, such as Caribbean islands, depend on very limited number of commodities, sugar, bananas, and so on. Uh, as I say, Britain in the past always championed those causes, but that will no longer be possible in the post-Brexit world. Of course, trade isn't everything. There are other issues. Indeed, it is generally accepted that a substantial number of the slightly less than 52% of the people who voted on June the 23rd did so, um, those who voted to leave, did so because of concerns about immigration and in particular a wish to limit EU migration. Just to remind everyone, of course, as members of the EU, we are all part of the single market and one of the four so-called freedoms of the single market is freedom of movement of people to work, to live, obviously to study, as well in any of the 28 member states. And indeed, <coughs> after 2004, when there was a dramatic expansion in the size of the European Union, taking in eight former communist states, including three republics from the former Soviet Union, plus two Commonwealth islands, Malta and Cyprus, um, Britain was one of only a couple of countries that agreed that freedom of movement would uh, operate immediately for the new member states. Other countries such as Germany and France uh, insisted on a transition period. That was a major reason, of course, why so many Poles in particular came to Britain. And indeed, Poles now make up the largest single ethnic community in this country, 
uh, they've outnumbered even Indians. So in some parts of the country, not so much in London, which is multicultural, cosmopolitan, and has always dealt with immigration and diversity um, with a much more open approach. But in some parts of the country, there was undoubtedly resistance and even resentment to the sudden influx of workers from Central and Eastern European countries. This was despite the fact that, in fact, some of those workers were desperately needed because they were prepared to do things which unfortunately native Brits no longer were, such as picking fruit in East Anglia and other not very well paid and fairly arduous forms of labour. Now, when we leave, if we leave in 2019, that freedom of movement will be finished. In other words, new EU citizens will not be able to come here with the freedom that they enjoy at the moment, just as we, those of you who are British in the room, uh, we Brits will not be able to um, similarly just go off and live in France or Spain or wherever, uh, as has been the case up until now. But it's interesting to note, of course, that whereas particularly the conservative press railed against the fact that the last Prime Minister, David Cameron, had failed to meet his target to reduce immigration to tens of thousands as opposed to hundreds of thousands, and that effort failed. The latest figures were the last year was over 300,000 new people moved to the United Kingdom. Business is happy about that because many of them are young, educated and contributed very considerably to the British economy. But there has been um, some difficulty of adjustment in some areas because of pressure of services. So one of the, one of the many simplistic arguments in the campaign by the Brexiteers, by those who were campaigning to leave, was if we leave the EU, we can take that control of our borders, and that will mean, therefore, we will not have so many Poles, Romanians, Bulgarians, etc., etc., coming in. And to a extent, that is true, but it is also worth pointing out that despite immigration controls that have developed, evolved in this country since the 1960s, even last year, with over 300,000 coming in, the majority was not from the EU. They were from other parts of the world, and not least the Commonwealth. Uh, in many cases, family members joining people already here, or, or workers brought in to do specific things. Which then raises the question, if EU migration is curtailed after Brexit, does that then mean that there will be a demand for more workers from the Commonwealth? Instead of Romanians picking fruit in East Anglia, will we be recruiting Bangladeshis and Indians to pick fruit? Um, one or two ministers in the current government have argued that British workers ought to do these sorts of God jobs, but I'll believe that when I see it as uh, British workers have got used to a rather more comfortable form of uh, earning a living. So potentially, on the one hand, there may be actually an increase in opportunity for workers from the Commonwealth to come here, but because of the toxic nature of the immigration debate, I think it would be very difficult for any government, and particularly a Conservative government, uh, to push that line. And linked to that is the issue of students. Now this country, quite rightly, is proud of its academic institutions. In the latest international table, Oxford came out number one, and several other British universities were in the top ten, along with mainly American universities. And Britain has been a magnet for students, not least from the Commonwealth, 
to come here to study university degrees, accountancy, all sorts of trades as well as academic subjects. But the government has announced that as part of its campaign to limit immigration, it will be stricter on giving visas for students. This is bad for the universities, of course, because it will mean that they will get less money in fees. But I would argue it will also be bad for the Commonwealth because it will be more difficult for Indian, Pakistani, Nigerian, or whatever Commonwealth nationality um, the students come from to come to this country because of what I see to be as a major flaw of including student numbers in the immigration figures. So much of what I see for the future is actually quite gloomy. Those who believe or believe the message that was put out during the referendum campaign that Britain would recalibrate its relations so that the Commonwealth would become more important as it used to be um, than uh, it is now, I think are, are actually deluded. It is true, and I think it's worthwhile remembering, that the major reason Britain did not join the infant European steel and coal community and then the European communities as they evolved was because of Commonwealth links. Although Winston Churchill during the war, towards the end of the war, had spoken about a European vision and the possibility of a united Europe, after the war he did not um, recommend that Britain should be part of this new shape of geography because of the strength of our ties with what was at that time um, mutated from empire to Commonwealth and much of our trading relationship was with um, Commonwealth countries. We, uh, as people may remember, you know, we uh, imported butter from New Zealand and New Zealand land, um, things from Australia which were, when we joined the European Union, largely substituted by European produce. But since then, many of the countries, not least Australia, who are in the Commonwealth, have recalibrated their own relationships. So for Australia, the important relationships are with China and Southeast Asia, no longer with what some used to think of as a home country. And I think it would be very difficult to alter that situation. But most of what I've been talking about has made you being a little pessimistic, so let's try and give you some better news. And that would be in the field of cultural diplomacy, very much at the heart of this conference. I attended a, a very interesting event at the British Council in just off Trafalgar Square a few days ago, at which the um, Chief Executive, um, Kieran Devan, uh, spoke about his reaction to Brexit and what it would mean for the work of the British Council. He also introduced what for me was a new concept, and one that I did find quite appealing, which was instead of thinking about hard Brexit, in other words, leaving the single market and basically trying to swim alone, having cut all ties with the European Union, or soft Brexit, where we stay in the European, not in the European Union, but in the single market, um, he's spoke of um, rather closed and open Brexit. A closed Brexit where Britain would retire into its shell and um, become a, let's be frank about it, declining middle-sized country um, which has already been overtaken um, from the fifth position in the international league table by France thanks to the de devaluation of the pound over the last few weeks. We're now number six, and we can be sure that we're on the way down because others will, are coming up fast, overtake us. So there is that 
possibility if everything went wrong and the leadership from government was bad that we would have a, a closed Britain, a closed Brexit. And as Kieran Devan said quite correctly, that would be a terrible mistake. What we need, if we're going to have Brexit, is an open Brexit where Britain shows that it is open, not just for business, as the businesses are all trumpeting at the moment, but an open society. That we don't turn our back on Europe. After all, we are part of Europe, even if most British people never quite understood that with basic geography. But we should also be open to the Commonwealth as well, because there are very valuable um, links, cultural links of all kinds. And so, particularly in, in an age where communication is so easy, where even in African villages, many people have mobile phones and can do all sorts of uh, not only banking transactions, but communication with people through their mobile phones. We have a, a world out there with which we should um, interact, at least as much as we do already. And so, in cultural diplomacy terms, Britain really does need, to, or will need in the future, to, if it leaves the European Union, to rebrand itself and work out exactly what is the British brand. Um, because from the point of view of many Commonwealth countries at the moment, we are Britain in the EU, and Britain outside the EU will be a different sort of brand. But it has to be an open brand, and British values and British arts and creative industries have an enormous amount to offer. But before I give the impression that we're therefore able to sell up, sail off into some rosy future um, as rebranded re open Britain um, in an open world, uh, I have to sound a note of caution because actually it's in the creative industries which to my mind is such an important part of cultural diplomacy um, that there is most concern about Brexit. But a survey was done through one of the creative industries federations before the vote and 98% of respondents said they were voting to remain because they depended so much on the free movement of labour. Theatres, for example, that have not just technicians, but actors often who come from other European Union countries. Orchestras, football teams, you can name a whole raft of different cultural and sporting activities in which free movement has meant that Britain has an extremely high place in the creative industries and in sport. So again, in Rio, how the British team uh, did extremely well, and British sport has been very good. But that shouldn't be um, a reason for us to descend into some sort of closed nationalism, but on the contrary, to uh, make sure we remain absolutely international. And the creative industries themselves are crucial. Last year, the creative industries contributed 70 billion to the UK economy, that is a very significant amount indeed. It is also, interestingly, almost exactly twice the estimated cost of Brexit. Um, according to figures released yesterday, um, it is going to cost Britain £35 billion pounds to leave the European Union. For one reason, we're going to have to recruit hundreds of maybe, paradoxically, foreign trade negotiators <laughs> because we don't have any of our, our own anymore because Europe, the EU did all our trade negotiations. So, yes, I promised I'd be optimistic towards the end, but I have to say <laughs> that um, I don't think the picture is all that rosy. And there's a little bit of me, in fact, a big bit of me, that hopes that somehow, even though 
Theresa May said Brexit means Brexit. When it comes to the crunch in two years' time, it won't actually happen. Thank you.